So hello and welcome to another episode of Biographics. I'm your host, Cal Smallwood. Yes, that is- Oh no! My prop skeleton. I'm your host, Cal Smallwood, and today we're talking about Neanderthal, the origins, evolution, and extinction of humanity's closest relative. Oh no, my prop, my prop skeleton. You know, I'll just, I'll just hold my skeleton. There we go. I just thought, you know, skeleton be funny. And this video is based on an original article submitted to us by Radu Alexander. The date was 1856 and some miners were excavating limestone in the Feldhover Caves in the Neander Valley, near Dusseldorf, like their predecessors had been doing for centuries. During the dig, the workers unearthed some bones. No big deal, right? Just you find bones everywhere. And they thought it's probably just a bear or something, so they discarded the bones with the rest of the debris. One of history's greatest discoveries was almost confined to the garbage dump of history, but unfortunately, the mine's owner, the awesomely named William Beckershoff, saw the bones and was intrigued by them. His instincts told him that there was something to these bones other than just being the remains of an animal or something, so he took them to the closest thing to a scientist he could find, a local school teacher who was an amateur fossil collector in his spare time by the name of Johann Karl Fullrot. To his credit, Fullrot could immediately tell from examining the skull cap that he was looking at something special. It looked human, but not too human. The low forehead, the prominent brow ridges, the sturdy bones, they all suggest that this was a different kind of person altogether. But still, let's not get carried away. After all, Full Rot was a school teacher, not exactly an expert in the field. So he packed the bones and travelled to Bonn, where he consulted with a professor of anatomy called Hermann Schaffhausen, and he confirmed what Full Rot expected. They were looking at the remains of a primitive type of human. The Neanderthal had been discovered. So the duo did not immediately go public with their discovery. After all, as far as the entire world was concerned, this was the first ever fossil of an archaic human. It wasn't the kind of thing you just casually announce like next week's cafeteria menu. The pair made the announcement in 1857 and published their findings just a year later, but they were not taken too seriously by the scientific community at large. As we mentioned, no other remains of extinct human species have been found by this point, and it was even a few years before Charles Darwin published on the origin of species, and evolution was hardly a widely held view in many scholarly circles. As for the various idiosyncrasies of the bones, they were largely dismissed as being malformations, belonging to a disease, but otherwise unremarkable human from history. Fullrot and Schaffhauser needed two things then in order to gain scientific approval. One was recognition from a more eminent figure in the field, and they got it in the form of renowned Scottish geologist Charles Lyell, who examined the bones and concluded that they were of very, very old age. And the other was more fossils. If these remains truly belonged to a primitive species of human, then there should be more around, right? Should better find some more bones, go dig in. Well, as it turned out, not only were there other fossils about, but they'd already been discovered. Bones belonging to two different skeletons had been found in Belgium, while a skull that was fully intact had been discovered in Gibraltar decades earlier. However, it seemed that none of them had a local school teacher who dabbled in collecting fossils, so there was nobody to recognise the importance of the finds. Even so, with all this talk of a new species of human knocking about, people remembered that they had these fossils just sitting there and decided to you know, get them out for closer inspection. These remains were also intriguingly distinct from those of modern humans. Slowly but surely, the idea that we might be talking about an archaic type of human, distinct from Homo sapiens, was gathering steam. Finally, in 1864, the fossils were recognised for what they truly were, the remains of a different species of human. He was even given a name, Homo neanderthalensis, which we're just going to call Neanderthal for the rest of the video because that's that's what you know, right? You know Neanderthal. You, did you really know it was Homo neanderthalensis? I didn't know. I had to look up how to pronounce it. I, I, I just saw it. I just thought it was Neanderthal. Anyway, as you can probably tell, the species were named after the German valley where the fossil of Neanderthal 1, as he came to be known, was found. Technically, the bones in Belgium were the first to be discovered, but since Neanderthal 1 was the one who kicked off the whole hullabaloo, he decided that he would become the type specimen for his species. And with that, the field of paleoanthropology was born. A study of Neanderthals has been going on for over a century and a half, and it's still very much a continuing process. As a general rule, we're not going to go over each individual discovery and advancement and place them chronologically because that would only make things more confusing. And now that we've said that, let's immediately break that rule by looking at what happened in the years following the establishment of Neanderthal 1 as a separate human species. Over the next few decades, more remains of Neanderthals were discovered, mainly in Europe, but also in Southwest Asia. Even so, not everyone was on board with the whole extinct human species thing, and some prominent scholars delayed the study of 
proved Neanderthals by arguing that the bones they kept finding simply belonged to a deceased and deformed Homo sapiens. Mildly interesting for sure, but hardly something to revolutionise our understanding of humanity as a whole. Eminent German pathologist Rudolf Virchow was particularly guilty of this faulty reasoning, and he was convinced that rickets and arthritis were responsible for the physical abnormalities of the Neanderthal remains. With that in mind, the opposite camp, which remember argued that Neanderthals were indeed a distinct and extinct species of primitive human, received a giant boost to strengthen their case in 1908, when they discovered the, I um, hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, La Chapelle aux Saint Juan, simply known as the Old Man. As its name suggests, it was found in La Chapelle aux Saints, a commune in central France, and it was the first almost complete skeleton of a Neanderthal ever discovered. The skull in particular was a real find, as it prominently displayed the heavy brow ridges, protruding mid-face, and low receding forehead that is typical of the species. The remains were found to be around 60,000 years old, but the actual age of the old man when he died is still a bone of contention. Uh, always a fan of skeleton puns. Some say he was around 40 years old, while others argue that he was much older since the bones along the gums had begun to regrow after he lost several teeth, something that would normally take decades. Some scholars even speculate that the condition of the old man's teeth made it impossible for him to chew his own food, and that someone else probably ground it up for him. They saw this as the first sign that Neanderthals were not quite as primitive as initially thought, and that they lived in an altruistic society where they helped and cared for each other. But more on that later. Unsurprisingly, the old man was a landmark moment for our understanding of Neanderthals, but at the same time it also created a common misconception that goes on to this day. I think I know which one this is, it's that Neanderthals like, like this. They look like, you know, me, like, you know, your resident fact goblin. If we have to point the finger at someone, then we have to point it at Marcelin Boulet, the French anthropologist who was the first to study the old man. He was the one who assembled the skeleton, but he didn't make it look like a modern human, even though he really should have. In his mind, Neanderthals were brutish, dim-witted, primitive creatures more closely resembling gorillas than us, so he made the old man with a severely curved spine, a stooped stance, with bent knees, forward flexed hips, and the head jutted forward. He even gave the reconstruction opposable toes, like the great apes. And this image of Neanderthals survives to this day, despite being widely dismissed as inaccurate. This is still how people perceive Neanderthals, and the image is pretty far removed from the reality. Like, well, it is true that the old man suffered from osteoporosis, which would have impacted his posture, but modern experts still believe that Boulet should have known better, and that he let his own preconceptions cloud his judgement and affect his work when assembling the skeleton. In reality, Neanderthals were physically quite similar to us. Recent research suggests that they even had a gene that causes red hair. On average, their bodies were shorter and stockier, and they had larger noses and a distinct double-arched brow. But many scholars argue that if you were to take a Neanderthal man, give him a shave, a haircut, put him in a nice suit, most people would find him indistinguishable from any other man on the street who had a podcast. Now of course we're only talking about the physical traits that go skin deep here. If you were to start to delve into the nitty gritty of Neanderthal anatomy, there's plenty of differences between them and us. For example, any bone expert could immediately tell if remains belong to a Neanderthal or a modern human by looking at the skull or the pelvis, which are noticeably different. Strangely enough, another reliable way of telling our species apart is the middle ear. The three tiny bones we have in there are vital in our hearing, but are more distinct between Homo sapiens and Neanderthals than they are between the chimps and the gorillas. Despite our extensive research into the origins and evolution of Homo neanderthalensis, it is still pretty much a vast and dark cave of knowledge, into which we catch occasional glimpses of light. Uh, we should stress that a lot of this information is still not universally agreed upon, but it does represent our best understanding at the moment. So, you know, if you're watching this 10 years down the line, hey, is everything still on fire? Let us know in the comments. So contrary to what some people might think, Neanderthals are not our ancestors. They are more like a distant cousin. It is instead believed that we both evolved from the same ancient ancestor, perhaps Homo heidelbergensis. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, they might also be the ancestor of a third hominid species called the Dysonovians, who have only been identified for the first time back in 2010. Just to show you that major discoveries in paleoanthropology are still happening quite regularly. The divergence between our predecessors and Neanderthals might have happened sometime around 400,000 to 500,000 years ago. As we already mentioned, not everyone is on board with this line of thinking. For example, a group of scientists dropped the equivalent of an anthropological bombshell in 2016 when they announced that they would recovered the oldest Neanderthal DNA in the world from some bones at Simadilla in Spain at the Poreco Mountains. 
dated to approximately 430,000 years ago. They wanted to push back the divergence of Neanderthals from their ancestors a few hundred thousand years. This would have made it far too early for our common ancestors to be the aforementioned Homo heidelbergensis, but just right for another extinct species called Homo antecessor. So there is now a distinct group of scholars who believe that Homo antecessor was the last common ancestor between us and the Neanderthals. Not, uh, again, I'm going to try and pronounce this one last time, Heidelbergenis. And the two sides get along about as well as the Jets and the Sharks, but with far less dancing and far less clicking. So the only solution is, of course, a dance battle in the middle of the street, followed by a knife fight. So we joke, but we might not be sure when Neanderthals first appeared. We have a pretty good idea of when they died out. It seems that their numbers start to plummet dramatically around 40,000 years ago, and very few traces have been found that are more recent than that. That being said, some pockets of Neanderthal civilization may have stuck around for a while, the most significant being in Gibraltar. Proponents of this idea believe that the Gorham's Cave in Gibraltar was the last bastion of Neanderthal society, and that hominid cousins managed to survive there until 28,000 years ago before finally going extinct. Their heyday, however, was around 100,000 years ago, give or take 10,000 years. They lived all over Eurasia, inhabiting regions stretching from England, going all over continental Europe into Central Asia, and as far east as Siberia. When our ancestors hopped over the Mediterranean Sea from Africa into Europe, the two groups collided. And yes, in case you're wondering, they did get their freak on. So they did do the horizontal nasty in the past year. So most research seems to indicate that modern humans and Neanderthals interbred, which is why many people today still have a bit of Neanderthal DNA in their genetic code. And this has its ups and downs. After mapping the human genome, we saw this DNA is associated with skin and hair, possibly making us hairier and sturdier to survive colder climates, while also being involved in boosting our immunity systems. On the other hand, Neanderthal DNA seems to be closely associated with certain illnesses such as diabetes, lupus, and Crohn's disease. If you have to suffer with any of those, you can blame the Neanderthals. Which is a weird sentence to say, but yet, yeah, it could be true. Going all the way back to Boulay's interpretation of Neanderthals, which shaped our perception of our primitive cousin, we developed quite a low opinion of them. Basically, we looked at the Neanderthals as nothing but a hunched over, grunting savage who was closer to an ape than he was to us human. But ever since then, most discoveries we've made about Neanderthals would suggest pretty much the exact same opposite, that they were intelligent and had a culture that was on par with our own at the time. Uh, their brains, oddly enough, were bigger than ours in proportion to body size, but then again, so were the brains of ancient Homo sapiens, so that alone isn't saying much. But Neanderthals got up to the same stuff as our ancestors. We know they liked to do a bit of painting, not just on cave walls, but in order to decorate their own personal items. For example, there's a 36,000 year old king scallop shell recovered in Spain that had been painted with red and yellow iron oxide minerals. This was before Homo sapiens came to the region, so it had to be the Neanderthals unless the bears in that area are particularly artistic. There also wasn't any practical purpose to this, which means that the Neanderthals sometimes just liked things because they were shiny and pretty. The shell itself was also probably just used as a pendant, which wouldn't be the only example we've found of modified jewellery. Cave walls were, unsurprisingly, Neanderthals' favourite medium, although it seems that the primitive artist was more of an engraver than a painter. Dozens of such engravings have been found in the Paleolithic sites across Europe in the Middle East, all tentatively dated to a time before Homo sapiens came onto the scene. The oldest one of all is approximately 57,000 years old and is found in Cave's Loire Valley and was only announced a short while ago in June 2023, once again showing us that new developments are always happening in the study of our long lost cousin ancestors. If we were willing to wade into the murky waters for a bit, we could make the highly controversial and still doubtful statement that Neanderthals even had a musical side to them. Scholars have found multiple bone flutes which are tens of thousands of years old, and the debate rages on of whether they were made by Neanderthals or Homo sapiens. Remember, we did coexist for a time. One flute in particular, known as the Dive Babe flute, is said to be about 60,000 years old. It was unearthed in Slovenia in 1995, and it's made out of the thigh bone of a cave bear. If the age of this flute is correct, then it would not only be undoubtedly of Neanderthal origins, since our ancestors hadn't made it to Slovenia yet, but it would also be the oldest musical instrument in the world. As we said, this is a hot take that is sure to rabble rouse the scientific community, so take it with a large pinch of bony salt. Their crafting skills were also up to snuff relative to the time period they lived in. We have recovered all sorts of Neanderthal tools and weapons, ranging from precision tools like small blades and scrapers, to medium-sized hand axes and large spears used for hunting. Stone was unsurprisingly their material of choice, but they also dabbled in woodworking, they processed animal hides for clothing, and even also used organic tools such as shells and pumice stones. One particularly interesting discovery in a cave in Israel suggests that they might have even recycled tortoise shells to use as rudimentary containers. Which makes sense. Bone, bone is better than hand. Now the one thing that Neanderthals 
did not do though is develop long range weaponry. All signs indicate that their hunters like to go up close and personal with their prey, even when they were taking on big game like mammoth and bears. They preferred to grip a large thrusting spear with a lot of power behind it instead of something more versatile and light like a bow and or arrow. They might have made smaller spears that could have been thrown, but definitively no bows or arrows have ever been found. Now nowadays, some research believe this could have contributed to their eventual extinction. Once modern humans came along and the two groups began competing for the same resources, our use of bows and arrows made us far more successful hunters and left less food for our Neanderthal cousins. Also, like, you know, short and squat. Like, we know, like, you know, fantasy literature has taught this. Like, you know, if you're short and squat, like a dwarf, you use, like, hand weaponry. You're tall and live, like an elf, use a bow and arrow. Just science. We arrive now at one of the most contentious points in regards to the study of Neanderthals. Not that anything we've said so far has been a slam dunk. Funeral rites. Now we know that Neanderthals did intentionally bury their dead, at least on rare occasions, but was there any kind of symbolic or religious meaning behind it? Was there some kind of ceremony or did they just dig a hole and chuck them in? So for decades it's been suggested that Neanderthal burials were simply practical, if they could have been bothered to do them at all. This was in line with the common view of Neanderthals as primitive and animalistic, but one cave in Iraq might might change all of that forever. It's called the Shanidar Cave and it's been an absolute godsend for anthropologists for over half a century thanks to the many remains and artifacts discovered at the site. But there's a recent find that might be the biggest one of all. The skeleton of a Neanderthal man that has been subjected to a so-called flower burial. Clusters of pollen were found in the soil he was buried in, suggesting that others threw flowers into his grave. This will be the first sign of any funerary rite practiced by Neanderthals, but skeptics point to the pollen and saying it could have come from burrowing rodents or insects, or even from the people excavating the site itself. So we just quite simply do not know for sure. Finally, we arrive at the big one. Why did the Neanderthal go extinct? And to put it plainly, we don't know. Scientists have been researching this answer for decades and we're still nowhere near a consensus. Obviously, the strongest inclination is to blame us for wiping out the Neanderthals. Unfortunately, we do tend to be pretty good at that sort of thing. And the timeline also does unfortunately line up quite well. Neanderthals had lived in Eurasia for hundreds of thousands of years and then BAM! 40,000 years ago, poof, they disappear. Whether or not they still survived in small pockets is up for debate, but they certainly disappear from the vast majority of their habitat. And coincidentally, this is just around the time when Homo sapiens crossed into Europe from Africa. We outcompeted them for food, resources, and shelter. We could have brought along some fancy new diseases that they had no immunity towards, or we could have simply fought and killed them all. And it could have been a nice little mix of all three, but the end result was the same. Score another win for Homo sapiens. One recent hypothesis proposes the exact opposite though. It says that the Neanderthals died out because they made love, not war. Specifically, it argues that interbreeding with Homo sapiens on a large scale is what eroded the Neanderthal populations to the point of extinction. This goes against the current general consensus, which says that although the two groups did mingle, very diplomatic language used there, from time to time, uh, it was only a casual thing and it would not have led to any serious effect on their population numbers. So this is very much a new and controversial idea idea, but there's another one that's been going around for a while and it's picked up some steam in recent years. Instead of blaming us, this notion claims that climate change drove the Neanderthals extinction, specifically a thousand year long cold snap that occurred in Central Europe around 40,000 years ago, which would have led to a massive habitat degradation and fragmentation for the Neanderthals, even before Homo sapiens made it out of Africa. This same model asserts that this cooling period did not affect the areas inhabited by our ancestors as severely, so when the two sides finally met, we already had a giant advantage going into it. Numbers. By the time Homo sapiens made it to Europe, Neanderthal populations had already dwindled significantly, and those who were left were no match for our superior numbers and advanced, for the time, technology. That technology being a stick, but it's a stick that go far. So these are the facts as best we know them, and even though we know more about Neanderthals than any other extinct species of hominids, the gaps in our knowledge are still quite severe. In a few decades, or even a few years, many of them might not even be true anymore. Replaced with new ideas as our understanding of our extinct cousins keep evolving. So thank you for tuning in to this episode of Biographics. As noted at the start, this video is based on an original article by Radu Alexander, and I've been your host, Carl Smallwood. You can find links to both our socials below. This is, oh god, this is Bonely. Uh, this is a mascot from my own channel, Fact Fiend with Carl Smallwood, and since we're heading into spooky months soon, he will be making many, many appearances in our content. So if you want to see more from myself and Bonely, check out the links to my own channels below. Finally, if you enjoyed this video and you liked it, leave a like. If you've got something to say about it, let us know in the comments. In particular, my hosting and presentation style, which I've been working on trying to refine in the last few weeks. So, yeah. Also, uh, but the comments about my hair... I, 
Come on, lay off my personal appearance. Like, you have you any idea how hard it is to tame this mane? It's not great. And also, I'm not shaving it to like Simon. So I've got a big square head. That looks like a Lego man. Either way, uh, if you want to see more content like this, subscribe. And as always, I hope everyone out there has the day they deserve. And cheers. Also, yeah, I know I've been, I mispronounced Skellington. I mispronounce skeleton as skeleton a lot, but I just find skeleton a fun word to say. Skellington. There we go. Do you, you have a good day, Bonely? There we go. Oh!